We've been around for, according to scientists, some 200,000 years, um, we human beings. Whereas the universe itself is 14 billion years old, or 13.8, or something like that, right? Um, so if you do a little calculation, that means that we human beings have been around for 0.002% of the universe's existence, of the universe's history. So if you compare that to a day, like 24 hours, like a full day, we show up in the final few seconds of the day. And for most, by far the, the largest part of the day, we're not around. Um, so that's us. Pretty rough version of us. So, Homo sapiens. Um, and the same point applies to the size of the universe. So there are um, some 100 billion planets in our galaxy. There are some 200 billion galaxies in the observable universe. So you have to multiply the, the former number with the latter, right? So there's at least that number of planets. And you know, out of that number, we inhabit exactly one planet um, called Earth. Um, so if you look at the scale of the universe, it is massive, it is huge. And we inhabit only one out of those, those many planets. So the basic idea is, look, um, Christians, theists, but Christians in particular, believe that, that God has created human beings in his image and that in a way we're the crown of the creation. Um, but if you look at the universe, the scale isn't right. Because if God values human life, we would have been there from the very start, or at least not in the final few seconds, and we will be everywhere. But look, we, should, we are only here, like we've been around for a few seconds, really, and we're in this little corner of the universe, and that's it. So how come? If God truly existed, that would not be the case. That's the basic idea of the argument. And that's why I call it the argument from skill. Now you might think, are there actually people who defend this argument? And the answer is yes, uh, even some fairly influential ones. Um, so here are a few examples, a few quotes. So Michael Shermer, so he's the um, director or, or president of the Skeptic Society. He says, um, and here he is, um, why would a deity make a universe that is 13.7 uh, billion light years in radius in which practically none of it is usable, usable for human beings? It's just a waste of stuff. Why would a deity do that? And here is a long quote by Sean Carroll, the famous cosmologist. This is going to be a long quote. Um, there we go. Um, but I think it nicely illustrates the point. There are many features of the laws of nature which don't seem delicately adjusted at all, but seem completely irrelevant to the existence of life. In a cosmological context, the most obvious example is the sheer vastness of the universe. It would hardly seem necessary to make so many galaxies just so that life could arise on a single planet around a single star. But to me, a more pointed observation is the existence of generations of elementary particles. All of the ordinary matter in the universe seems to be made out of two types of quarks, so up and down, and two types of leptons, electrons and electrons, uh, electron neutrinos, as well as the various force-carrying particles. But this pattern of quarks and leptin is repeated threefold. The up and down quarks are joined by four more types, just as the electron and its neutrino are joined by two electron tri particles and two more neutrinos. As far as life is concerned, these particles are completely superfluous. All of the processes we observe in the everyday workings of the universe would go on in essentially the same way if those particles did not exist. Why do the constituents of nature exhibit this pointless duplication if the laws of nature were constructed with life in mind? So if God had constructed the universe and the laws of nature with the purpose of creating life. Right, it's a long quote with some nice, you know, neutrino talk in there. Um, but it's basically the same point. And here's the final example um, from my supervisor, Herman Philipsen. Um, so he wrote this book, God in the Age of Science, which was published two, three years ago. So he says, it seems to be completely at odds with God's intentions, as far as they can be scrutinized by theologians, uh, so he's not very impressed by the work of theologians, that about 80% of all matter in the visible universe is dark matter, which is undetectable by electromagnetic radiations, as cosmologists tend to conclude from various lines of evidence. What is all this dead rubbish good for? Furthermore, 
Why would God create an open universe that will continue to expand indefinitely and will finally endure a heat death or even a big freeze when it asymptotically approaches absolute zero temperature? So this is, this is in the long run, right? If God's primary intention was to create man, it is a mystery why God would create a universe that will exist for an infinite future time during which no life will be possible at all. Right? So he, he also looks at the future of the universe and says, if, if we take that into account, then it makes even less sense. All right, so these are a few examples. Um, so these are examples that you find um, in books and articles, but you will also find them in like public debates or on YouTube, for instance. Um, and there's, um, well, what was I going to say? So, so influential scientists and philosophers have put this forward in books, articles, and uh, public debates. It's also often heard from bar stools. Here's what they look like after a few drinks. Um, there are some, and this is interesting, there are some similarities with, um, and differences with other um, arguments in apologetics. So arguments for God's existence, arguments against God's existence. So some similarities with the fine-tuning argument and some differences. But here's the point. As far as I know, Christian philosophers or scientists have not responded to this argument yet. So if you think I'm mistaken about that, do, please do let me know. But as far as I know, this is not the case. So that's why I'm going to try to provide a response to this argument and see whether it um, holds water. That's the plan. Are you still with me? Yeah. yeah? Okay. Before we do so, though, let's be a bit more rigorous and see what exactly does the argument say. We've seen a few quotes, but let's try to make it slightly more formal, right? Like, put the, what, what, what are the steps of the argument? Um, well, it's often put forward by scientists, and they like the likelihood principle. And this is the likelihood principle. A piece of evidence, E, favors one hypothesis, hypothesis one, over another hypothesis, number, number two, just in case the probability, P, that you will find the evidence, given the first hypothesis, is larger than the probability that you will find the evidence given the second hypothesis, right? This is a principle that's often used in science. Um, this is just a formal version of what happens when evidence favors one hypothesis over another hypothesis. And um, so in, I've a written version of the paper, and there you will see that I try various versions of the argument, but I think um, a version in terms of comparative likelihoods is the best one. So a version that compares the likelihood of this enormous skill given theism and given non-theism and a comparison between the two, right? I think that's the best version that, you will, uh, that one can construe. So what would it look like? Here's what it would look like. Um, the first step is this. Probably, I mean, I add probably. We're, we have to be careful, right? So probably. Probably if God created the universe with, amongst others, the purpose of creating intelligent, free beings like humans, it would not be the case that significant spatial and temporal parts of the universe are inhospitable to such agents, right? So basically, if theism is true, then the universe wouldn't be this vast and empty without human life. Um, second, if there is no God, right, if God does not exist, Significant space and temporal parts of the universe would be inhospitable to intelligent free beings like humans. So if God does not exist, then an empty universe is not strange at all. Right, that's only, it's, not, it's to be expected. So that probability is fairly high. Um, and when we look at the universe, this is the third step. Significant spatial and temporal parts of the universe are inhospitable to intelligent free beings like humans. So that's the... That's the empirical part, right? That's what the universe looks like. Hence, here we have the conclusion, the evidence favors the hypothesis that there is no God over the hypothesis that there is a God. Right? So the scale of the universe counts against the existence of God. Um, that's, that's the argument, really. I think this is the best version that one can give, better than other versions that you will find. So I thought, let's criticize the best version, because if the best version goes down, well, then so go the others. That's the idea. Um, look, um, it's still a fairly modest conclusion, right? The conclusion is not there is no God, uh, but only that the evidence 
but regarding the scale of the universe counts against the existence of God. But there might be other evidence that counts in favor of God's existence. But what I'm going to do is to try to see whether even this restricted version works. So I'm going to look at each of these three steps. Um, and um, the first one is the most complicated one. So for the sake of simplicity, I'm first going to discuss number two and number three. And then I'm going to turn to the first step, to return to the first step. Okay? All right, so let's start with step two. What does it say? Well, it says, probably if there is no God, then significant parts of the universe will be inhospitable to intelligent free beings like us. My reply is this. Um, well, this all depends. Whether this is true depends on how physically demanding life is. If life is necessarily carbon-based, as some people think, uh, then yes, probably this is true. Um, but at this stage, it might, we might not be able to strongly assert a thing like this. We don't maybe know enough about life to, to be sure that life has to be carbon-based. Maybe life can arise in other ways that are not carbon-based. Um, so I'm somewhat skeptical about this step. And note that this is maybe something important to point out. So the argument has three steps. Um, if any of these steps fails, the argument fails, right? They all need to succeed in order for the argument to work. So if step one fails, the argument is out the door. If step two fails, the argument is also out the door. So if this one fails, it's already out the door. Um, so I'm, I'm skeptical about this one. Um, but this has an important repercussion, um, namely with regard to the fine-tuning argument. Because the fine-tuning argument does rely on the idea that life has to be carbon-based. So the conditions for life to arise are fairly restricted. So if you, if you reject this, this step for this reason, then you also have problems with the fine-tuning argument. You see? But it's also the other way around. So if you think, if someone provides the fine-tuning argument and you say, look, um, the fine-tuning argument doesn't work because um, who knows what the conditions for life are, right? That maybe it need not be carbon-based. If that's the case, if that's your reply, then you cannot embrace the argument from skill because you cannot embrace the second step, right? So if you reject the fine-tuning argument, the argument from skill is also out of you can't embrace that one. So there's this interesting relation between the two. And then you will still have to deal with the other arguments for theism, like the argument from religious experience, the cosmological argument, the argument from consciousness, and all the other arguments. Right? Um, but as I said, um, all the steps need to succeed. Um, so I've given one consideration against this one, and let's move to step three. So that one says, um, significant spatial and temporal parts of the universe um, are inhospitable to intelligent free beings like us. Well, as I said, um, there's the same problem. Um, well, there's the problem, uh, same problem as with two, so we're not sure about that. But here's what one might reply. Remember that Herman Phillips says, um, look, there's the heat death hypothesis. So the heat death hypothesis is that in the long run, all the stars will burn up, or, uh, well, that's the big freeze, or a heat death, so it will end in a in a big heat and all life in the universe will die, right? And no life will be possible. And he says, and then, then it, that will be like that forever, right? So no life will ever be possible again. So even if it's been possible for a while, it won't be possible again for an infinite amount of time, right? So what about that one? Um, so I've got two replies. So the first reply is um, the heat death hypothesis is, not, um, is, is no longer embraced by many cosmologists. So it used to be fairly popular, um, but um, it is no longer that popular nowadays. So most cosmologists embrace different models of the universe. For instance, a retraction model. So the universe um, st starts again, and so it, it, it expands, and then it collapses, and so forth, right? So you, have, you could have various kinds of life. And, but the second and more important reply, I think, is if God exists, and he's the creator of the universe, right? then surely God can deal with the problem of the de heat death hypothesis, right? 
if you, if you can create a universe, then surely you can do something about this problem. You can rearrange stars, or you can adjust the laws of nature, or you can easily do something that will prevent the heat death. So don't buy into this. But I think there are further problems with this step. Um, another point is, for instance, who knows where we'll go in the future? Um, so, um, and, and who knows how we will be able to adapt to different circumstances, right? So currently we're on planet Earth, and maybe we should stay on planet Earth, but it might be the case that we, we come to inhabit various planets in various galaxies. And the final thing is, I don't think we really know how empty the universe is at this stage. I mean, we've seen some parts of the universe, but compared, compared to how big the universe is, we have hardly seen anything of it. So we, at this stage, we can't really say whether the universe is largely empty. We can't really say. All right, um, let's move to the final step, which was the first step, um, which is the most complicated one. So I'm going to lev level a few objections against this step. So here's what the step says. Um, so it says, is, it says um, if God created the universe with, amongst others, the purpose of created, creating free beings like us, it would not be the case that significant parts of the universe are inhospitable to such agents. But why think a thing like this? Right? Why should we think this in the first place? One needs to come up with um, an argument to, to support this, uh, this step. And remarkably, I, I have not really been able to find an argument in favor of this step. So I tried to do so myself. Um, so I'm going to provide two reasons. Um, that, maybe at the background. Um, so here's the first one. Uh, the first one is, more is better. So if God values life, his life is valuable, well then, the more of it, uh, the better, right? So if you like collecting stamps, uh, the more stamps, the better, right? Um, if something is valuable, then the more of it there is, the better. Well, is that really true? I don't think that's actually true. Um, take a for instance, music. Um, it's nice to enjoy good music, um, but you don't want to continuously enjoy music, right? It's not the case that the more, the more of it all is better, always. Um, or take cuisine, like good cuisine, good food, right? You don't want to have endless amounts of food, like a certain restricted amount of good food, that's really enough, right? But here's the reply that one might give. Look, that's true, but that's true because we're human. We have limitations. But God, God is without limitations. He's infinite. So our stomach, you know, we, we will build up at some point, so we can't eat anymore. But, but God, he can enjoy things infinitely, right? So for him, surely the more, the better. Um, I'm not even convinced about this one. Um, and I think it's easy to, th well, I mean, how to reply to this. I think uh, one way is to consider, um, to think of yourself um, as being without limitation. So imagine you don't have any limitations. So you have infinite amounts of time and infinite, you can go everywhere you want and so forth. And then consider children. So I wrote this paper with a friend of mine. He's got four children. Uh, he likes children. And he says, look, I've got four children, and I love them, and uh, maybe it would be nice to have six or seven, but I, I wouldn't want uh, a thousand or a billion or ten billion or, you know, um, even if I had infinite amounts of time and energy, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want always more, more children. I mean, a certain amount is, is, is okay. Uh, I mean, they're unique, and that's really enough. It doesn't really get better necessarily if, if there's more of it. So I don't think this first reason is convincing. Let's go to the second one. Uh, you might think, well, what's, vis what's valuable is visible. Like uh, water is highly valuable and it's very visible. We saw the uh, planet Earth, you immediately, see, you immediately see water, right? It's everywhere. Same for oxygen. Oxygen is valuable, it's everywhere on Earth. Um, historical events that are really important, such, such as the invention of the printing press, that's an important thing. Well, you can see the results everywhere, even here, like, 
Look, this is, please repeat the question. There is no question, but this is an example of um, how influential the printing press has been, right? It's everywhere, even in this room. So, if human life is valuable, it should be visible in the universe. Not only on this one planet, it should be, it should be everywhere. That's the idea. All right, um, again, I think there are good counterexamples. Elementary particles are imp important. The universe consists of elementary particles, but you can't see them, right? They're way too small to see them. Um, and and there are um, immaterial things, such as the faithfulness of one's spouse, right? So whether your wife or your husband is faithful or not is a really important thing that matters a lot, but it's not something that's visible, right? It's not something, well, unless you put a, a camera on someone's head uh, like 24-7, but it's not something that's visible, normally speaking. But it's really important. So I think um, things can be really important without being uh, very visible. And a second point has been made by um, a philosopher from Oxford, Guy Kahane, um, who is not himself a theist. Um, so he says, and I think he's right about this, significance has nothing to do with how much there is of something. So he's written this paper um, about the significance of extraterrestrial life. And he says, look, even if we're the only ones in the universe, we're still tremendously important and valuable, right? Because we are rational beings, we're moral beings, and so forth. We are utterly unique. So even if we're only on this planet and hardly visible, we still have great value. So whether something is valuable and whether it's visible has nothing to do with each other. All right, so the arguments for this step uh, don't work. Um, here's a consideration against it. And this is maybe my most important criticism of the whole argument from skill. Um, because I believe that God may have a wide variety of purposes in creating um, the universe. And other things might be highly valuable as well. So human life is valuable, but there may be all sorts of other things that are also valuable or maybe equally valuable. So here are some examples. Um, planets, stars, and dark matter, right? Um, they might just be, it might be very valuable that they are out there and that maybe the, uh, some of it is beautiful actually, right? So maybe you've seen this um, creation scene in the movie Tree of Life. Has anyone of you seen the movie Tree of Life? So there's this creation scene and you see all the stellar systems and uh, black holes and all sorts of planets and it's so impressively beautiful. So that might be of great value. Um, certain events might have great value, such as the spontaneous and autonomous development of the cosmos, right? Such that God, once that God had made the, the universe, it, it unfolded itself, like, and God didn't have to interfere or jump, jump in here or there all the time. No, it unfolded itself gradually, right? And that may have, be of great value. Um, properties of the cosmos as a whole. So, Certain places of order and other places of chaos, or places of life, places without life, a certain balance might have value. And finally, something, um, this is a bit speculative, but I mean the argument is speculative, so we can speculate in response. Um, uh, divine virtues, such as self-restraint and patience. So maybe it's the case that God could have like littered the whole universe with life easily. But maybe it was a good thing for God to say, I can do so, but I'll restrain myself. I'll, I'll do it here. I could do it everywhere, but I'll, I'll just do it here. I'll, I'll be patient. That could be the case. Who knows? So God might have a wide variety of purposes. And in fact, I think, so I didn't, I didn't mention it here, but I think if you're a Christian, then you will have good reasons to think that God has a wide variety of purposes. So even in the Bible itself, so take Psalm 8, for instance, where, um, where the author says, um, What is man that thou art mindful of him? Or something like that. Someone quoted it in the King James Version the other day. Right? So, so clearly, even at that time, people were aware uh, of their own, uh, not insignificance, but their relative significance in comparison with this huge cosmos, right? Um, all right. Um, my final, um, my final consideration has to do with, uh, so this is the final consideration regarding step one. It has to do with the idea that we should be skeptical about whether we can know such a thing as one. 
And here one can borrow a page or two from so-called skeptical theism, um, defended, for instance, by Trent Doherty, the American philosopher. Um, has any one of you heard of skeptical theism before? No? So, so very briefly, the idea is this. Um, it's a response to the argument from divine hiddenness. So the argument from divine hiddenness says, um, look, if God exists and he cares about, about us, right, he would reveal himself. He would give us plenty of evidence of his existence because he would want to have a relationship with us. So he would be clearly visible and we would all believe in him. But God is not visible, right, hence he doesn't exist. That's the argument from divine hiddenness. And there are many ways to reply to this argument, but one way is skeptical theism. And skeptical theism says, um, we're human beings. We don't have this overview, you know, of God's intentions and purposes. We can't really take that transcendental perspective. So um, we should be very skeptical about our ability to say, look, if God, if, if God existed and he cared about us, he would give us more evidence. And skeptical theism, something like that, might be applied in this case as well. Um, there are two different approaches. Um, one, one emphasizes the principles and the other emphasizes the cognitive limitations. Um, I'm, I think they amount to the same thing, but there are two different approaches. So the first one could say something like, like this. Um, the following principle, I don't see it, therefore it isn't there. That's not a valid inference, right? So that, focus, that focuses on the principles in the argument. And the cognitive limitations approach says, um, look, we're very limited in our abilities. So um, we don't know all the facts. We, we don't know, maybe it was physically necessary that there was a long history um, for life to come about, right? Maybe it just took billions of years. Maybe that's necessary for planets to come into existence and then life to come into existence. But they both amount to the same thing. We can't really know the first step of the argument. All right, so I've um, sketched out the argument in three steps and a conclusion. And for each step, I've given one or several reasons to think um, that it's problematic. And if any of, any of these reasons is sound, then the argument um, collapses. And um, so I think, I, I think there are quite a few reasons to think that it's false. So, this brings me to my conclusion, which is simply this. The scale of the universe does not count against God's existence. Um, one might even think that it counts in favor of God's existence. Um, but that will be a story for another time.